generation. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. This segment is brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. And we've got some great guests again today, as always, coming up for you in about eight or nine minutes or so. We're going to talk to a Kansas City woman who struck genealogical gold, something she thought she lost years ago, but then found it recently. And what a piece it is. You're going to want to hear this segment. Plus, later in the show, Sonny Morton is here. Sonny is a regular on the podcast Genealogy Gems with Lisa Louise Cook, and she's answering a question a lot of people are asking, which of the big four genealogical websites would you use for what purpose? It's a great question. She's going to have some answers for you later in the show. And right now, let's head out to Boston and talk to the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Hello, David Allen Lambert. Hello, sir. Well, I'm not in Beantown right now. I'm actually at the 14th New England Regional Genealogical Conference out in Springfield, Massachusetts, the same town that brought you Indian motorcycles in the home of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Very nice. And by the way, I want to thank you on behalf of my daughters with the worldly advice of your relative on men they should watch out for. Oh, <laughs> yeah. If you go to ExtremeGenes.com, I posted some stuff. You know, many of us being the family historians of this generation inherited stuff from the family historians of the previous generation. And my mother had a cousin. She sent me incredible genealogy gold. And among it were a couple of pieces that she tore out of some turn of the century magazines. And one had a picture of a man, a very stylish looking early 20th century guy. And under his picture, it said, never marry a man of this type. The woman who marries a man with a physiognomy similar to the above, the weak points in whose character are further described on page 857 is likely to have a life full of trouble and to rest in a premature grave. Mothers, caution your daughters. (laughs) My heart goes out to our listeners listeners who look upon this picture and see their beloved spouse yeah. in the image on the screen. <laughs> Absolutely. By the way, there's one for the other side as well, the women that you don't want your sons to be marrying to. So it, oh, it's, it's great stuff. Oh, girls you would not bring home to mother. Exactly. Exactly. And <laughs> I'll tell you what, you might even see her ankles. You can see in the picture. So be careful there. <laughs> All right, let us spin the wheel of wherever today to see where we're going to start out with our family histoire news. All right, laddie, it's Scotland. You don't happen to have a Scotland story on you, do you, David? Well, heading up towards the Highlands, we do in lovely Edinburgh. But this is not for the faint of heart, because in 19th century Scotland, if you were put in the ground by your loved ones, you didn't always stay there. Because of the days of the schools of anatomy, grave robbers would often haunt cemeteries. In fact, some of them even went so far to kill people to say that they had stolen the body. So Scotland came up with a neat idea. Cage the dead. Put locked cages over the burials of their loved ones so no one would dig them up. You're kidding. That's crazy. So this was going on because medical schools needed bodies so they'd go dig people up? Exactly. It harkens back to the days of Frankenstein with the body stealing that was going on. The same thing. They would need bodies for anatomy classes. So originally it would be the incarcerated. They were executed, but then they would start going to the fresh graves of people at night and by lantern, dig up the body and deliver it straight to the medical schools where they would pay for these ancestors of ours. So when you go visit an ancestor, now if they didn't have a cage over the grave, who knows if there's anyone down there anymore? Oh, that's terrible. And the ground would be soft, of course. Exactly. Well, my next story is 
also over in the UK a copy of the Declaration of Independence. Did you see that story? Yes, I did. This is incredible. I didn't realize that there was only one copy of the Declaration, and that's the one that's on display in Washington, D.C. But these uh, history hunters got a little clue that something might be across the pond, and that's where they found it. Right in Chichester, England, they found a handwritten copy of the Declaration of Independence, almost like if someone said, make a copy and send it over here. And it doesn't have the signatures of the signers, but it has their names written out. But it's quite a large vellum document and could be second to our copy in Washington, D.C., the most valuable copy of the Declaration of Independence. And they're saying it dates back to about the 1780s, but they really don't know who was behind it and why. Who knows? Maybe there was a copy that was sent to George III for his reading pleasure. (laughs) Every week, we like to give a blogger spotlight, and I like to give a shout out to my friend and colleague and fellow genealogist, Heather Rojo, who does a blog called Nutfield Genealogy dot blogspot dot com. Now, Heather's grandmother back in 1920, when she was 15 years old, kept a diary. And this has been one of the more popular blog posts that Heather has done. She's had about 20 installments. Can you imagine being a teenager 97 years ago and what you wrote about the people you went to school with, your neighbors? So the community is chiming in to find out what she wrote about their family members. Wow, that's fun. So she takes a quote from each day of the diary, right? Exactly. And then she puts a physical image of the diary, associated images, etc., But, you know, the nice thing about this, even though it's Sudbury, Massachusetts, it's also applicable to anybody out there. Any of our listeners who have the diaries of their own ancestors could do this and start a blog. Yeah. Imagine if uh, somebody, say, in the South had a diary from the Civil War. To post that on a blog, it'd be incredible. Absolutely. And the wonderful thing about that is it would allow other people that they're associated in that diary that may have never even known a clue or an anecdote about their ancestors. So good or bad, it's a wonderful way of sharing family history. And in Boston, we'd like to introduce the idea that maybe we can help you with your family history. We would like you to become a free guest member of NEHGS at AmericanAncestors.org. And if you decide you'd like to join, why don't you use the coupon code EXTREME and you'll save $20. We'll talk to you soon, back when I'm in Beantown again. All right. Thanks so much. And coming up next, a Kansas City woman and a discovery of an old recording that she thought she'd lost years ago. You'll hear her and the recording in three minutes. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. 
Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. And we are back. It is Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth. And this segment, by the way, is brought to you by MyHeritage.com. And I ran into this story not too long ago and did a little tracking down to find my next guest. She is Lori Sue Rudy Meyer. First of all, welcome to Extreme Genes, Lori. Where do you live? Kansas City, Missouri. It wasn't long ago you were doing a little scavenging around the house and you ran across something that you were aware of from when you were a child, but thought perhaps it was lost. Tell us about the experience. It was a record, a 45 record, and the title on it but was Love and Kisses. I started digging through trunks and I found it again and I looked at it, and there was like a drop of white paint on it, and I thought, oh, it's no good anymore. Wow. Now, this goes back to what era are we talking? Because 45s were around in the 50s and the 60s. What era does this one go back to? Right during the beginning of World War II. So this was one of those recordings that a service person would do stepping into a booth, right, and then send it back home to the girlfriend or mom and dad. Yes. The American Red Cross supplied that to soldiers going away. So this was a break in the action for your dad. Was he home on leave or on his way out? I believe he was in the initial phase of leaving the country, and he landed in Chicago, where everything was supplied to these young men before they went overseas. He was in awe because it was a big city. And where did he grow up? Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. And Cleveland's a big city. Was he in the outskirts or in a rural area? A rural area. Okay. And so he left his girlfriend behind. Oh, it just happens to be your mother, so I guess we know how that all turned out. Tell us about this relationship. How far along it was at that point, would you say? Well, my mother was at nursing school there in Cleveland, and apparently she fell in love with my dad. He came from a very poor rural farm with a lot of children. All he had was dickies to put under his sweaters. He didn't really own any nice clothes or anything, but he kept rotating the dickies to look like he had different shirts on underneath his sweaters. <laughs> and my mother came from Shaker Heights, which was known as a very upper class neighborhood. But they fell in love in college. And when the war was calling, my dad left. But in college, nurses were not allowed to be married in nursing school. Huh. But somehow or another, my parents cheated the system and they had gotten married. Oh, so were they married at the time he made this recording? Yes. Were they secretly married or were they openly they married? They were secretly married. Secretly married. Okay, because I know listening to it, I don't hear any reference to them being married. More like, uh, hey, hey, you're my girl kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Being yes. very, very sneaky. So when did you first become acquainted with this record, Lori? When I was in grade school, probably in the 60s. And I wanted to keep it, so I put it inside, I think, like the family Bible so when I moved from Florida 
back to Kansas City, I knew it was well kept, but it was so well kept, it was kept for me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how many years has it been missing then? Oh, I, I hadn't heard my dad's voice probably in 40 years, I believe. And so after the war was over, what did he do for a living? He then went on the GI Bill, and he went to Ohio State University, and also down um, in Louisiana, and he received a degree of civil engineering at the time. Okay. So he really kind of broke out of the rural lifestyle. Oh, yes. And so when you found this record, which wasn't that long ago, how did you discover it? I really don't know how I did, but I was really excited when I saw it because it's very odd to be able to hear your father's voice when they've been in the grave, you know, for 25 years or 25 so. years ago, early 90s, huh? Yeah. It was delightful. And I went to the video store and they've been copying 10 pictures and other pictures for me and I brought in that and Chad said that shouldn't be any problem and within a couple of days he called me and he says I have it done digitized said, yes and I was so excited but he didn't want me to hear it until the TV crew came oh <laughs> you got a little coverage for that yes Yes, so for the first time in years. And when I heard his young voice, I was just like, no, he sounded like he was old forever when I was growing up. <laughs> of course. And then I could hear his accent being from up in the lake area, the Greater Lakes area. And he used to tell me about sailing on the Great Lakes and being caught over the border of Canada and picked up. But uh, his ancestry is from Austria, and also from France. So when he went overseas, he was very excited about going to France and all the European front over there. He was in the Army in the Airborne Division. Oh, boy. And he became a Master Sergeant. So let's give a listen to your dad's voice now from this recording okay. that has been digitized back in your home place in Kansas City. This comes from the Chicago Servicemen Center. Hello, June, darling. This is Jim remembering you. I thought this little record would please you. Anyway, it's different than writing. And in case you don't like it, it's very easy to shut me up. Just turn the switch. No kidding. I do hope you like it. And if you only knew how I have labored with this script and how my knees are shaking, you would appreciate it. Even if I don't, don't do much, but stammer. Now to tell you some, some things if I can get my tongue untwisted and find a place to start. Let me say here that Chicago hospitality can be equaled anywhere on any basis. We servicemen have everything our little hearts desire. Free shows, dancing, eats, the best libraries, writing rooms, games, dormitories, valet service, ride street cars and buses free, and so many nice things that I'm at a loss for words to describe it. Yes, sir, they do have about everything and give us everything but the key to the city hall, and you can't blame them for holding that out on us. How's the sweetest and finest girl in the world? I don't need to tell you I miss you, and I'm starving for your love and affection. Life is fine, and the only great disadvantage is this transaction of love by mail. Well, it just doesn't agree with me. When we get this mess cleaned up, I am planning to change that as far as we, can, we are concerned. And until then, dear heart, I will just have to dream you will be there. Turn the record over when... When this side is played out. Honey, I just got through reading all I've said to you off of a couple of cards, so now I'm on my own. We're having a swell time here. There's five of us. We're running around together, and I guess we just got through playing ping pong. We had supper here. We're having a good time. I just wrote you a letter, and I wrote Mom a letter. And we're planning, I guess we're planning to go bowling, right, as soon as we get out of here now. Then we'll probably go around and try to see a little bit of Chicago. I sure wish you was here with me now. Prairie Old is outside the window now making a lot of fun of me. All the fellas made records and sent them home. This sure is a swell place. There's everything from soup to nuts here. They have all kinds of game rooms and library and stationery and everything you want to eat. How's all your studies going at school? I suppose you've been over to see Mom lately. I wrote Mom a letter and telling her I was sorry that I didn't get to write lately, but we've had so much to do. We finished all our work on the plane, and we shipped the plane back to Bear Field today, so... 
That's all. Two of them are all happy about that. It's been cold as the devil back in the tent. Last night we had peaches for supper, and before I had the chance to eat the peaches, they froze tight in my pan. Well, I was just about running out of words, and I guess we're running out of record, too. So I'll say goodbye, honey, and I'll write you again tomorrow night. How does that make you feel when you listen to that, Lori? Emotional. When you lose your parents, it does make you an adult. And I'm in the generation up next for, you know, the last one standing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think many of us are. Many of us are. But it is fun to hear that. And when you think that it's just not as common from back in that era to have audio recordings, that makes this uh, even more of a treasure. Was there anything in there that you heard that surprised you or you found unusual? Well, he was so excited about being in Chicago because Chicago used to be, during those days, a really great place to go. And he talked a lot about everything that was offered to the soldiers at the time. And I could just imagine all those young soldiers out and about probably on their own for the first time in a big city. So have you shared this audio with your children or your nieces or your nephews? Who all has gotten a copy of this? Well, I called my niece and told her, and then she posted Facebook to our family. And so it will live forever. Yes, yes. And so will his jacket and his pipes and his fishing lures and everything that I have left of his to cherish. Well, she's Lori Sue Rudy Meyer. She's in Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you so much for coming on, Lori, and congratulations on finding this incredible treasure of your dad. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to honor him. It's the greatest tribute that I can give to him while he's dead. Well, it's the greatest generation, too, Lori, and he was part of that. Yes, he was. I was very proud of his accomplishments in life. I think you should be. Thanks so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. What a great thing to have preserved. Over 70 some odd years old. Incredible. Hey, coming up next, we're going to talk to Sunny Morton. She's a regular contributor to the Genealogy Gems podcast with Lisa Louise Cook. And she's going to talk about a question that many of us get all the time about the big four genealogy sites. What are the strengths of each of them? Which ones should you use for specific projects? We'll find out more from Sunny in five minutes on Extreme Genes. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. (laughs) 
And welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and this segment is brought to you by RootsMagic.com. I first became acquainted with my next guest uh, a couple of years ago at a lecture she gave at a conference in Salt Lake City, Utah. And more recently, she gave a lecture at Roots Tech that has everybody buzzing. Everybody wants to know about it. It's the genealogy giants comparing the four major websites and Sonny Morton, who is uh, an associate with Genealogy Gems, Lisa Louise Cook's tremendous podcast. Welcome to Extreme Genes. Great to have you on the show. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be here. So you are just packing the halls at Roots Tech talking about the comparison of the four genealogical giants in the industry and, and some of the pluses and minuses for each of them, because there really is a role for each site, depending on what it is that you're doing. So go ahead and explain exactly how you laid this whole thing out. Well, certainly, this is a really hot topic. It's a question on everybody's mind, whether you're a beginner or whether you've been at this for a little while, you really are asking yourself sometimes, which website do I really want to use? As the industry gets bigger, there's more out there, and it's so hard to keep up with all of them. Yeah, you're absolutely so, right. And the other aspect is, is where do you plant your flag, right? Because you don't want to be exactly. entering things on each site by hand, and it's kind of difficult on some to transfer material over to it. Totally agree. So the big sites that I really wanted to pinpoint in this lecture that seem to really have the most international audience are going to be Ancestry and Family Search and Find My Past and My Heritage. So when you say the four big websites, those are the four I really targeted. And often a lot of us know one or maybe two of those sites really, really well. And when it gets to the others, we're kind of scratching our heads a little and saying, you know, I really haven't gotten over there or I heard something about it. I just haven't tried it. So that's really what my talk is all about, is to help people um, really get inside the, the mind and the structure of a website and what they have to offer before they've you know, shelled out the money to subscribe or hours to try to learn it themselves. Well, let's talk about some of those advantages. I think we have uh, the issues of dealing with American records might favor one site over another. And then if we're looking into, say, European records or African records, we might find another site is more beneficial or advantageous to us. How do you separate them out? You know, it's trickier than it sounds. You'd think you could just go in and count the number of records per country on each site, and you can't really do that because each site might count their historical records a little bit differently. For example, is a birth record one record because it's one certificate, or is it three records because mom, dad, and baby are all mentioned, and therefore it's three names? Right. It depends on the site, Scott. It really does. Well, it sounds like it. So as you go through these, how do they count them? I wish that I could just give you a magic formula and then we, we could do a conversion and have an algorithm that would make it really easy. But it depends on the record type. The census records that they have tend to even out. They're, they're really one-to-one in terms of the numbers, tend to look fairly even across the spectrum. But again, once you get back to a record like a birth certificate, that's where you're going to see the different numbers showing up for even the same databases. Sure. And there's another trick there, Scott, is that once you start comparing the records at each site, some of them have the very same content, the very same databases. Um, sometimes because they've all gotten some record content from Family Search, which has partner relationships with each of the commercial sites, Ancestry, Find My Past, and My Heritage. So they've been distributing some records, but also sometimes because some of those records are easy for each of those sites to source themselves. Right. And so they all have it. But sometimes a site might only have an index to a particular collection, while another site might have the images to it. And then another site might go above and beyond what everybody else has because they've gone out and gotten some exclusive rights or they're the only ones so far that have captured particular kinds of records. And that's where you really see leadership in the historical record content. And one thing that I've done even since I gave that lecture back at Roots Tech in February is I went ahead and took the time to do a country-by-country comparison for more than 30 countries, saying who's got what records, who's got some content versus who's got particularly strong content. And that's something that I put in this new guide that Genealogy Gems is publishing for me. It's a list of all these 30 countries saying who's got the stronger content relatively from going into the back end of the site and really doing a deep comparison 
of the databases that they have on those sites. Another thing that's been a real aha moment for a lot of people that I've taught this lecture to is a lot of people don't realize that the structure of the family trees on Family Search versus the commercial partners, Ancestry, Find My Past, and My Heritage, the structure of those trees is actually different. And so the experience of working with the trees, the pros and cons, the privacy level, the right. sharing and collaboration, those are all different at Family Search versus the other three websites. So I actually really like teaching that part because I see light bulbs go on and people says and they say, Oh, now I understand why I'm having this experience over at Family Search, which has one big world community tree right. versus over at Ancestry, find my past and my heritage where each each user builds their own individual tree and sets individual privacy settings. And there are advantages to both. I love the wiki model on Family Search because you can find material from other people all right there. But I also like having control of my own tree on all the other places. Yes, that's absolutely true. And, you know, I'm asked, how do you even look at these and do you pick a favorite? Or at the end, what are you going to tell me? At the end of all of these comparisons, are you going to tell me which site is the best? And really, Scott, there's no one answer for right. that because, like you said, there are clear-cut pros and cons of those tree formats. I might need records from Germany right now working on my tree, and you might be looking at an unknown parentage case, and you're looking for DNA connections, and you're looking for a fresh set of trees that you can look at for hints. So you might be looking for a different website. And so it really does depend. And I think it's really important if we want to make great progress in our genealogy research to know about the strengths of each of these four websites and what our different options are for accessing them. Because there are free access options, you don't have to subscribe to all of them. You don't right. have to pay out the wazoo in order to access each of these sites. Right, and there are special offers and that type of thing. Speaking of which, you have this book now. It's available, I assume, online, right, through genealogygems.com. Yes, so genealogygems.com. So what this is is a four-page quick guide. So it will just, in those four pages, lay out for you in very clear bullet points and table format what you need to know to make judgment calls about the main points that I've been talking about here, the historical record content, the different trees, you know, how many of them are there and how do I work with them. I talk about DNA testing features that are available at the two sites that offer it. Again, the privacy settings, what you can do with a free guest account, what you can do in terms of library access and the subscription costs. And so we've got this guide, and it's brand new on the genealogygems.com website. And it's available for nine ninety five in print format, and the digital version is available for six ninety five. But I have a promo code for you and your listeners, so that it will be even less. Awesome! So you want to hear it? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so ten percent off of that guide with the promo code Web Ten. That's a W E B ten all together, all caps. And that promo code is good until July 31st of this year, 2017. And again, that's for 10% off of the Genealogy Giants comparing the four major websites quick guide that's available both in print and digital download format. She is Sunny Morton. She's the Genealogy Gems editor and book club guru. Thanks so much, Sunny. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Scott. And on the way next, it's our Preservation Authority, Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. Hey, if you're looking to scan something, what kind of DPI should you use? What does it really mean? Well, Tom gets under the hood on that for you. And other things, more questions from you, the listener. It's coming up for you in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Now, everybody needs a place of their own to plant their family tree, preferably one that no one else can mess with and only you can control. That perfect place is Roots Magic. Roots Magic has been a family history standard for years, and now Roots Magic 7 is on the market. It's an award-winning genealogical software program which makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easy. You can start from scratch or import data from other software or even family search. Roots Magic 
also automatically finds records relating to your ancestors from MyHeritage, FamilySearch, and soon Ancestry and Find My Past. You can use it to create beautiful charts, reports, and books. And have you ever thought about making your own family history website? Roots Magic can make that happen too. And of course, there are free videos, guides, and technical support to help you along. Isn't it about time you planted your family tree? Whether you're a beginning genie or experienced professional, Roots Magic is the perfect tool for you. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. World, and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Got to tell you, I love talking preservation, especially when I'm shelling out so many things to other people. Hi, it's Fisher, and this is Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. This segment is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. We're talking preservation with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. Hi, Tom. Hello. And this past week, I've been actually sending out documents, old records that I got, and big collections that came to me relating to my family, but it related to other branches that did not tie to me. So I've been tracking down descendants of those branches and trying to get those things out to people. And they either want scans or they want the originals, and I'm happy to do it. But it's fun to see that people are really getting involved now in collecting those heirlooms that are so rare and talk about real gems. But it's really important that they know exactly what they're doing, especially when it comes to sharing. Oh, absolutely. In fact, with the digital age that we're in the middle of right now, everything is so much easier to do. People are a lot more educated, but sometimes education can be dangerous. Right. Having just a little bit of knowledge is actually probably worse than none at all. Exactly. And in any kind of thing, you're going to run into people who have different opinions. You know, that's why we have Democrats and Republicans. People have different opinions. And so there's more and more of these genealogy mini roots tech conferences going on across the country. Different people are getting in and expressing their opinions. And then people are talking to us at roots tech or emailing us. Some of the things that they're hearing are kind of a little bit um, Off. not. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's a nice <laughs> okay. way to say it. You're, you're, you're gently easing into this. What are we talking about specifically here? Okay. We're talking about people say, I love what you've told us about slides, but then somebody else told me this. What do I need to do? We always tell you, it depends what your end game is. If your end game is quality is number one, you don't care about price, then you want to go high DPI, you want to get the best scanners you can, or go to a place that has super high technology scanners, even if you have to go to a place that makes billboards or something, because they scan super, super high quality because they've got to make a huge billboard out of a 3 by 5 print that sure. the customer's given them. 
So you need to kind of understand the language. And this is one segment I apologize up front. You're going to have to go and get the podcast and listen to it again. Or read the transcript because every show is transcribed now. So you can kind of get the gist of it. So you're saying this is like a 404 course here? Uh, At least. 404 on steroids. Oh, boy. I'm not that good. I'm going to wash out of the class already. (laughs) I know that. Well, what you need to understand, like we said, what your end game is. Some people say, no, you always need TIF. Some people say, no, JPEGs, then convert them to PNG. Some people say you need NEF. Some people say you need ROS, all these different kinds of things. So what I'm going to try and do in this segment, the next segment, is kind of break it down so you understand a little bit about them so you can decide, hey, is this overkill or not? And if you don't totally understand it, you can always tweet me at AskTomP. In fact, we put up a chart a couple weeks ago about basic scanning skills. Now, when you're into the scanning world, people talk about DPI. That's one of the biggest things that everybody knows what DPI is, which is... Dots per inch. Exactly. However... When is dots per inch not really dots per inch? When you get into different quality printers, they're different. For instance, if I take my laser printer, which is a great laser printer, and I print out a 8 by 10 sheet at 250 DPI or whatever, it's going to look XYZ. If I take that exact same file, that exact same DPI, and print it out on my big MUTO, which you make the great big banners off of, it's going to look a thousand times better. And people are going, well, how can it be the same DPI? It's the way the printer lays down the dots, whether they're just solid dots or kind of overlaid dots, how the color saturation is. There's a lot of different things that go into printing. So most people, most professional printers, when they're talking about DPI, they're talking about the output, how they're going to print it. So the input is usually done in megapixels. For instance, let me give you an example. If somebody brings a slide into us and says, okay, I want this scanned, we're going to do it at 16.2 megapixels, which is 16.2 million pixels. And so after the break, we'll get into some more information about exactly how these work. All right, Tom, I'm going to have to review my notes already, (laughs) try to keep up with you. I'm already thinking of things that I can use this new knowledge for. Hey, we'll dig a little deeper here in this high-level college course that Mr. Perry is sharing with us. Coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. 
genie.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for The Weekly Genie. And we are back talking preservation with Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. All right, in our last segment, we were talking about dots per inch and why they only matter on the output that we're getting. And that's why on the input side, we have to be dealing with megapixels. Is that right, Tom? Right. Megapixels is a better way when you're talking about scanning slides, photos, different things like this, because it gives you more understanding of how many pixels there are. Because DPI is basically, as we mentioned in the first segment, the printer prints so many dots per inch. But when you're scanning things, you're actually really scanning it in megapixels, However, most things to keep them on a consumer level will use DPI as a reference, which sure. is fine. But megapixels is what's really important. So if somebody's scanning slides for you, you want to know how many megapixels they're doing it at. For instance, like 16.2 megapixels is how we scan slides. And so to tie this into English, if you wanted to print out, say, like a 16 by 11 inch print, that's going to be printed at 300 DPI, which is going to look absolutely wonderful. I mean, it'll look amazing. Sure. Because you scan this little teeny 35 millimeter slide at 16.2 megapixels. So when you make an 11 by 17 approximate print, it's going to look absolutely beautiful because it's scanned so high, it's actually looking at this little slide like it's really 16 inches big. Okay? Wow. We did some that we did with Notre Dame over in Europe, and you could actually see across the Rhine River seagull poop on the roof of the cathedral. <laughs> I mean, that's how tight it was. Wow. It's amazing. <laughs> we all need that. <laughs> exactly. So can you imagine how the artwork, all the you know little chips in the brick, all these different things just stand out so beautiful. Now, if all you're doing is scanning your items and you don't want to do all this kind of stuff, then you can do it at 1,200, 300, 600 DPI, depending on what you want. If you really want to do some fancy editing where somebody has a photo that's kind of like even maybe a little bit blurry and out of focus and some artifacts in it, you want to scan that really, really high. And if you have the equipment like Photoshop or Digital Darkroom, you can scan it in lossless form, which is usually referred to as either RAW, R-A-W, or NEF, which is N-E-F. That's like 14-bit data for editing. So you can go in pixel by pixel and remove that seagull poop from the top of the, <laughs> the cathedral. It's just it's amazing what you can do. And without any of it getting under your fingernails. Exactly. So it makes it really, really nice. So you might have these old pictures. We have a lot of people bring us in photos that were torn and damaged that they want them to look brand new. And we have ones come in and they even though they're looking at it, they still can't believe what we were able to do with it. And it's all digital. It's not really hard work. It's smart work and time consuming. Time consuming. That's right. So that's what you have to be careful with. So any of these things, if you got time, you enjoy doing these kind of things, these are great opportunities to take those old photos, scan them at a high DPI or have somebody outside scan them for you at major megapixels. Then you can go in and play with them pixel by pixel, move things around. And it's actually a lot of fun. Oh, it is a lot of fun. I just had a cousin send me a picture going, can you help with this? And it had tears in it and chips in it and lines right through an eyeball and, and through the nose and actually able to restore her. So she looked undoubtedly pretty much as it was originally. It looked pretty good. I was pretty pleased with it. Oh, it is. And the thing is, like I say, it's not hard. And with YouTube out there now... You can find some kind of a video or multiple videos right. of how to do these things. Go in and type Photoshop photo restoration, and you'll find a ton of YouTube videos where it'll go and walk you through piece by piece and show you how to do this kind of stuff. So it's something you can teach yourself. Well, and even if you know a fair amount about it, you'll probably find a point or two that'll help make it even better for you. Exactly. If you still have questions, you can always email me at asktom at tmcplace.com or go to my Twitter account at ask. 
Tom P. All right. Great stuff, Tom. Thanks for coming on, and we'll see you again next week. My pleasure. Hey, that's it for this week. This segment has been brought to you by LegacyTree.com. Thanks for joining us. Hope you got a lot out of it. By the way, if you're just starting out, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Dive in, and you'll learn. By the way, we have assets for you waiting also with our weekly Genie newsletter. You can sign up on our website, ExtremeGenes.com. It's absolutely free, and a lot of good links in there for you. Inspiring stories and information. Talk you again next week and remember as far as everyone knows we're a nice normal family